Ya no quiero, ya no quiero torear al toro rabón. Ya no quiero, ya no quiero torear al toro rabón. Mejor quisiera tu chiquita que bailes conmigo el son. Así pasamos la noche, corazón con corazón. Qué bonitas, qué bonitas son las costas de Guerrero. De mujeres sensitivas, hombres bravos y de hacer. De mujeres sensitivas, hombres bravos y de hacer. She started off just as a, uh, a regular little girl. Uh, her father was um, of German descent, a Kahlo, and uh, her mother was uh, Mexican, and she, her father had immigrated to Mexico because of all the trouble that was starting to happen in um, Europe. And uh, when she was six, she had her first bout with uh, physical pain. She had polio, and it settled in her right leg. And she was sick for a long time. She used to have, uh, they used to do baths on her leg, uh, walnut baths, I believe. That was the uh, therapy at that time. And then when she was a teenager, she uh, was in a terrible bus accident that should have taken her life, but it didn't. She lived through it, and it was to haunt her the rest of her life. Uh, her back was broken in several places. Uh, her right leg was the same leg that she had the polio was pretty much crushed. Her right foot was crushed. Her pelvis was crushed. Her back was broken in several places. Her collarbone was broken. Um, and then she was skewered. Uh, by a handrail through the lower back and out the vagina and had over 30 operations in her lifetime and it was she was racked physically with pain for most of her her life after that point she met Diego uh, he was doing a mural at the uh, preparatory school that she was attending at the time and uh, I guess it was like love at first sight and she was uh, would kid with her girlfriends that uh, she was going to marry Diego and have his children. At 17, I, I fell in love with Diego Rivera. But my parents did not like this because they said Diego was a, a communist. And because he reminded them of a, a broigo, pero, pero muy gordito. They said it was like the marriage between an elephant. Una paloma. I suffered two great accidents in my life. One in which a streetcar knocked me down. Y el otro accidente es Diego. In the eternal fruit tree, tus frutas give their aroma. Tus flores give their color, growing with the joy of the wind and the blossoms. Do not stop giving thirst to the tree of which you are the sun, to the tree that treasured your seed. Diego, Diego, Diego is the name of love. Oh, he was incredibly charismatic, as I understand. I mean, he was really ugly. He was probably over six feet tall and weighed, oh, two to three hundred pounds. I mean, he was an enormous man. But women fell for him. He was always, always had uh, girlfriends and uh, 
always, always with women around him. They just flocked to him. And he, it must have been his personality and his charisma, his own personal charisma. That's all I can figure. She used to call him the uh, Saporrana, which is um, frog. And he does look like a frog. He has bulging eyes and very round and kind of bulging jowls and kind of an ugly guy. <laughs> He was a very popular man in Mexico, even, you know, he was a, an artist that was already known in his day, and uh, the Mexican people loved him. They loved his work, and uh, I think she was probably attracted at first at, uh, in that way, and then just getting to know him and his personality. He was just always joking and laughing and having fun. and. And I think she was just attracted to that. Diego um, was a womanizer and always was. And um, during their marriage, he had many um, affairs. And I think probably the one that really finally broke the camel's back was um, the affair that he had with Frida's younger sister, Christina. I'm in such a state of boredom and sadness that cannot even do a drawing. The situation with Diego is worse every day. I know, I know that some of the fault for what has happened has been mine for not understanding what he wanted from the beginning and for having opposed something that could no longer be helped. After months of real torment for me, I have, I have forgiven my sister. I know that for the moment, Diego, Diego is more interested in her than in me. And that I should understand that it is, it is not his fault. And it is I I who should compromise, but it costs me so much that, that you have no idea of what I, what I suffer. The Dos Fridas is uh, a two of herself, very different in nature. Uh, the one being the Tejuana, which is the, dressed in the native clothes. Um, and she exposes a full heart. And the vein goes uh, from the heart down the arm and is connected to a small picture of Diego. On the other hand, there's the uh, more Victorian uh, Frida, the colder, the more uh, distant, and her heart is exposed, and it's cut in half, and the vein that comes out of that goes down her arm, and she is holding it uh, with a pair of surgical clamps, and slowly the blood is just dripping down onto this white, pristine Victorian dress. The whole feeling is one of loose, uh, in contrast to something that's very stiff and held. Taking excerpts from her diaries, uh, she just goes on and on about how much she loves Diego. He is her son. He is her, her um, tree of life. I mean, he is everything to her, and she loves him more than anything. Frida knows that he is having affairs and knows that if she wants to be with this man that she has to compromise. 
And actually, after that divorce um, in 1939, 1940, she was not the same Frida anymore. They would be totally independent money-wise. She would not depend on him. Um, they would not have any sort of sexual relationship whatsoever. And uh, that seemed right to her. She just wanted to be with him, and he wanted to be with her, so they did. She's a fine example to women of all walks of life, people who know her. And you can look at her as the woman who never had children, the woman who suffered with Diego and his many affairs. You can look at her as the woman who was bisexual. It's not easy now, but then it must have been quite difficult. She speaks personally to each one of us. You know, and I've had women say, tell me, tell me about Frida. Why should I like Frida? Why should I know Frida? And I can't tell you why you should like Frida. All I can tell you is, I know why I like Frida. I know what Frida has done in my life. Generally, she's a um, kind of coaxing, seductive presence in my life. That when I am afraid to do something, reading my poetry, I think Frida wouldn't have been afraid. You know, in that sense, she gives me the courage. And if she would have been afraid, she would have had a shot of mezcal or tequila, and she would have done it anyway. So that's what I did. <laughs> like all women, I think the, the full moon always affects me in an interesting way. And it seems that um, come full moon or come new moon, there's always a poem, or at least an itch of a poem trying to come out. And this one is called Calling Down the Moon. There are days when bitter prayers are essential. Forces that we deny during the day grow until finally memories erode and give way to revelations that pull and tear body and spirit in two. You can see me on those full moon nights. I pray like my mother, if my mother could only pray for passionate hands and full wounds. On those nights, I am not a hanging ghost, nor the image of the Madonna that you half see, icy face occasionally warmed and made real by the candle flame that flickers and gives importance to the ordinary orphans scattered on, dresser, on the dresser bureau. You really do see me on those blue, blue nights calling down the moon. You try to believe that you've imagined me, but you can't deny me like my mother would if she could only know me naked on those muffled nights. I call you through stars and moon and water. My chant lacks only their names, the name of your father, the name of your mother. If I knew them, I would need only to light the candles and insert their names into my womb to make me grow a you, to make me complete. It was Gabriel Garcia Marquez that you know, coined the term, and it was for literature, magic realism. And he said, the stuff that happens in Latin America is real, but it's so unreal that the only term that could fit it would be magic realism. And he gives us great stories of little girls that die and were buried for 12 years and then are unearthed and eventually come back to life. And he writes it in such a way that you cease to question. You suspend reality. You believe it. It is, in fact, magic realism. And that's the way Frida painted. I mean, when she had the image of her thinking of Diego, and it shows Diego in her forehead, I can understand that because I'm compulsive. And when, I th when I'm thinking about somebody who's maybe on an airplane, that's all I'm going to think about, even though I should be thinking other things or doing other things. In the center of my being is that image, and I'm not going to forget, not for one minute. When she painted herself, she, she painted broken columns. She painted thorns in her neck with blood coming out. She painted tears in her eyes. So I thought, all right, I'm going to write what I really think and what I really feel. 
as painful as it might be. And so when I would write about missing somebody or about my heart being broken, I tried to use images as I was feeling them. So I wrote this poem for a friend of mine, Elena, and it's entitled Poema para Elena, Por el amor del bobo. La meretita verdad es que lo amo, pobrecita yo. En el primer instante que lo vi, cuando mis ojos atrancaron con los de él, lo adoré. Le di mi corazón, mi alma y últimamente mi cuerpo. No supo él cómo quererme, se fue. El bobo se fue y se llevó mi corazón con él. Y todas estas horas sé que tiene mi corazón envuel envuelto en su paño colorado, rojo como mi sangre. No tengo lágrimas, pero tampoco corazón. Recently, a woman asked me, does Frida haunt you? And I said, no, Frida doesn't haunt me. She blesses me. And what I mean by that is that a lot of doors have been open because of Frida and Frida's work. So I started doing these little presents, these little Christmas gifts, and they, you know, little Frida pins, little Frida earrings. And then all my uh, male friends were a little bit envious, and they wanted to have a Frida pin. And so I thought, but I knew that they wouldn't really use them. So I started doing these little Frida cositas, and they were personalized little shrinettes so that if I had a friend who was looking for a home, I put a little Frida image in a little cajita, a little box, and I put an image of a home and I, little different things that symbolized specifically for him they meant something. And so I started giving these away. And in their own generosity, they started giving me Frida images and Frida things. When she painted herself, she, just, she didn't paint just the exterior of Frida. She opened up and said, here I am. She was a very vivacious and spontaneous woman. You did not see the pain when you went to visit Frida. I mean, there would be uh, laughing and singing and, and just like a party always around her. You did not see the pain that maybe underneath it all she was really going through. She represents many, many different factions of society. I think she was an artist that spoke two people. Um, her work uh, definitely looked uh, at the world from a woman's perspective, and I think a lot of women really are wanting that, are wanting to see that. Disintegración was um, a picture that I took out of her diary that um, was one of the last uh, drawings that she did before she died. I think at that time her leg had been amputated. And after her amputation, she never really fully recovered. Her spirit never really, really came back.
This Colores program is available on home video cassette for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-328-5663.